Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host Agostino. This is episode number 113. Welcome to all my YouTube watchers, everyone listening via podcast apps, wherever you are, and any other platform that you're listening this to. This is the Agostino Zinger Show. Ha <laughs> ha! Fuck all that shit. Imagine me starting like some NPR guy. Nah, man. We get hype up in here, man. Welcome back. I can see those things. Show episode number one, one, three, one, three, 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 three. What's going on, man? It's your boy, Agostino. Welcome back to the show. We're up in here, live and direct, nice and sunny. Feeling good, feeling fine, man. What's up? What's cracking? What's cracking, man? Week before Xmas, huh? Week before Christmas for you Christians out there, yeah? For you God worshippers, it's the week before you guys pretend like Jesus was born on that particular day and you give each other presents in some sort of weird appreciation of each other's love. Which is then feeding yourself back into the state of consumerism right now. And you're just giving the money back to 1%. But then you're trying to say that you're feeding the poor. Or whatever that means. Welcome back to the Ziggy Show. Episode 113. We're getting hype up in here. We get political. We get controversial, man. You know what I mean? Spot the triangles in my background. Spot the triangles. My, spot the triangles in my background, man. Spot the triangles. All seeing eye, man. We getting this. Anyway, above all my... Um, nonsensical hype. Welcome back to the Excel Zinga Show. It's episode number 113. Thank you so much for tuning in, YouTube listeners, podcast watchers. <laughs> so I switched that around. YouTube watchers, podcast listeners, welcome back. It's good to have your company. It's sometime in when on Wednesday afternoon. I'm not sure what time it is specifically because I don't operate on time schedules. You know what I mean? Because I'm a free spirit. I'm a hippie man. Stand up, stand tall. LSD to the day I die. No one does that, do they? No one's like LSD, bang bang. No, no one's like that's what, that should be probably a thing right now in um, hip hop, innit? Um, I think only one that was specifically talking about LSD was ASAP and maybe Danny Brown for a period as well was talking about um tripping and shit but for the most part no one's really like trying to see no 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 one's no one's trying to um you know break through right reach into the promised land seek enlightenment tap into their inner being everyone's just trying to like you know uh numb themselves from the pain that's around them and you know we all do that i sometimes do that too you know when you go through a tough period you end up drinking more going out more partying more just to kind of numb the pain and to make you forget about your worries. I don't want to be worried anymore. Let me not feel any pain. But I would imagine if you were a creative type and you were um, expressing yourself in a form of music, music, then you would, you would think it was um, beneficial to maybe tap into your inner being, right? And unlock that part of you that you didn't even know was locked by taking a little bit of LSD, a little bit of acid, but a couple of mushrooms, you know, and tripping balls, and then decided to write some material. That would be fucking amazing. I bet it would be amazing, but, you know, maybe um, people don't want to seek that kind of enlightenment. Because there is, um, I, when I, whenever I think about trip, whenever I think about psychedelics, I always think about them in the terms of, uh, you know, that quote from Spider Man, with great power comes great responsibility. I think about some, something like that. Whereas maybe like, the, uh, the idea that you can artificially tap into a part of your consciousness that is not you're not aware of in that present moment or wherever you are, it might be a little bit too much power for one human to cope with. We already see how people get crazy when they get a level of fame because fame in a weird way is a kind of um, existential existence that you're not really in control of, is it? Fame, right? So imagine you appear on the news and you say something stupid. You appear on like, I don't know, they do one of those new segments where they're on the street, uh, they're in a city centre somewhere and they ask you a question and you say something funny and you turn into an internet meme. You're still the same lady from the, yesterday, but now all of a sudden everyone knows who you are and they've now uh, they automatically attributed the idea that you've, you've existed in this little square box in their living room. That means now you're somebody of note. You're somebody uh, that people should be lauding over or praising. You go down the street and people are calling your name. They're calling you the, I don't know, the tick tick lady, or whatever you said on the, on the news. Maybe maybe we've seen already the dark side of it. You know, I mean, people can't even handle uh, celebrity or fame in that regard, where it's just like it's something that's not even in your control, right? It's something other people are bestowing onto you, and people go go crazy with it. Their perceptions is all warped. They get entitled. 
you know, they change, they become a different person, um, they start wanting different things out of life, different worldview, they become numb to the pain of others, inoculate themselves, isolate themselves, you go on and on and on. So maybe the idea of like taking a little trip, taking a little tab of LSD, a little bit of acid, it might be a little bit too much for some people. You might see some things that you don't really want to see, or you might not be prepared to see at that moment in time, which is probably why people say a lot when you're doing LSD or those psychedelics, that you should be in a very safe environment. You should do it at a point of your life where you're not contemplating your life decisions, maybe. Maybe you don't do it when you're at a massive crossroads, right, if you can't handle it. Maybe you don't do it when you're like suffering from a big breakup. Maybe you don't do it when a close member of your family has passed away. Maybe that might not be the best place time to do it because you might have some some um you might have some uh, some feelings that you haven't not, you haven't actually expressed that are lingering or that are laying dormant that you're going to unlock and they might have catastrophic um, consequences. But sometimes when you are at a crossroads in life, maybe it might be the best time to take it, right? Because it might be you might dis- disassociate yourself from the actual experience because you hear that a lot when people take psychedelics you become like i remember when i did a little bit of it you uh you become like you're the third person it's like a third person view you know like you're playing call of duty you've got like the hand and then you've got like, the other one just behind and you've got the one that's behind 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 you see the whole body that's kind of how it feels like you know that's you and you can kind of guess where you're gonna go right it's like you've got like a half a second delay a millisecond delay so you can kind of like go right right right, right. You know i mean you can kind of guess where you're going right left right left but it's not you because it's in front of you. You can see your whole entire being. So that's what people say when you take psychedelics. It's a good thing about it. you. Disasso- you disassociate yourself from your like physical body, and you start to see things a little bit more clearer. Like, you know what? How, how am I taking this thing so seriously? Why am I being so affected by he or she? Why am I letting this situation get to me? Blah 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 blah. blah. And you can start when you then when you come back into you know regular consciousness, regular life that we're living in now. You can be, maybe make decisions a little bit more easier because um that's essentially why people maybe use it a lot in uh coding and programming and stuff, right? There, um, some some people in that world, the Silicon Valley world, they do a lot of micro dosing, right? In order to kind of you know open up a little another another part another neural pathway within their uh, within their brain, in the hope that you're gonna program a fucking uh, swiping card app a little bit better. I don't know. I don't know. What do I bloody know? Anyway, enough about existentialism and all that malarkey. Welcome back to the Exodus English Show. It's been an absolute incredible, incredible week I've had so far. Um, as always, I, I'm a big fan of Mondays. I'm a big fan of Tuesdays. And I also love Wednesdays. I think all days are made the same. And I think the moment you start looking forward to the Friday or the weekend, I think you've lost, in my opinion. So um, for me personally, I try to make the best out of all days. I try and see each day as an opportunity for me to click that reset button and start again and go on my mission and make something of my life. That's what I try and do. That's what I'm doing at the moment. But yeah, it's been an interesting interesting week and stuff, right? What did I do over the weekend? Over the weekend. So Friday, I went and DJed. Had a bit of a had a bit of a mare, I think, in the DJ wise. Just because you know, um, I might have had a couple of drinks beforehand that might that might have made me a little bit more tired. And I didn't eat, which is a bad idea. So drinking and not eating before you go and play isn't a bad idea because I was I was I'll say I was tipsy, but I was also tired. Um, and also, oh, and I forgot too. I, I did I did two work. No. I, I worked out twice in a day on Friday. I went for a run in the morning and I went to a gym in the evening, right? But then in between that time, I didn't eat. I think I, I didn't, my last meal must have been at like two and I wasn't fasting. I just forgot to have my dinner. So then by the time I left my house, I quickly grabbed the beer. So I drinking an empty stomach and obviously you get much, you get much more drunk a lot more quicker than you, than you would do on a full stomach. And by the time I reached the the, the bar, my back was aching because I did like deadlifts and kettlebell swings, all that nice stuff and squats and shit. So my back was aching. Um, I couldn't really move my arms too much, which is obviously not the best thing if you're on the DJ because you need to move your arms and your hands. Um, and then uh, by the time it got into an hour or so in, I was feeling really tired. But then thankfully, like in all things, I think most things uh, like that, especially uh, uh, a DJ activity that you know, requires some level of endurance in the same way when you run or something, you start to get a bit of a second wind. So I was feeling a lot. I was feeling quite tired when it got to about eight or nine. And I got a second wind and it just kind of like peaked up. I popped up a bit. Uh, I perked up a bit um, without having any Red Bull. I was going to have a Red Bull. But I was thinking to myself, I'm going to end at half 11. And I want to go straight home because I was on the, went to go on a Saturday. I didn't want to go after after on a Friday, which I usually sometimes do. So I thought, you know what? I don't want to take a Red Bull. 
because I'm going to be up and wired for ages. So I'd rather just like, you know, ride it out. And luckily, when it came to about nine, I perked up a bit. I got a bit of a second win. And then I kind of ended the night pretty strongly. And then uh, I decided to go straight home because I was going to go out on a Saturday. And then, um, yeah, kind of wrapped it up. Went, went out, went to gym again on a Saturday. So I've been fucking absolutely smashing it. Um, I'm going to do five days in a row this week. And then I did six days the other week. So I'm kind of smashing it um, now just because, you know, Christmas is coming around the corner. I don't, I don't fucking give a shit about Christmas, but... I do know that there is a prospect, there is a possibility that I'm going to be eating a lot of sugary treats um, and drinking a lot of bubbly juices. So I need to be able to have, I, I want to have a good base, a good uh, platform in order to kind of leave all that stuff on. So then when I then start running up again, I don't have to start from, you know, minus fucking 25. I want to start on like minus 10, for instance. So I um, decided to go home, slept, woke up quite fresh. Wasn't as drunk as I thought I'd be or hungover or whatever. Went for another run. And then on Saturday evening, I decided to go out. And I decided to go have a little bit of a party time at Mixed Garage in uh, Hackney Week, which was fun. I went to go see uh, Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez. I'm assuming he pronounced it Roy or Rui. Maybe it's Rui. I think it's R-O-I. Rui Perez at um, Mixed Garage in, um, in Hackney Week. Uh, which was amazing, man. Fucking amazing. Miss Carriage is probably one of my favorite venues, I think, out there. Um, it's a little bit weird because it's open. It's like a, it's like in a kind of, I don't know, it's just, just a regular, I guess, Hackney Wick factory kind of place. Um, this, I think that's where they store all their like kegs for beer for all the bars they have in that area, like um, the crate and all the other stuff, right? So, it's got like a bit of a weird feel to it. It's just one big room with like a bit of a balcony up top and a nice little smoking area on the outside. Um, and um, for the most part, it's quite a fun little arena, quite a fun little club to go into. Um, luckily, I was able to finagle a ticket from someone that didn't turn up for a tenner. He got one of the early pre-releases, but I think on the door it was like £15 or something, which was not too bad either. And it closed at four, I think. And Roy and, and Dr. Rubenstein came on back to back, I think about 12, right? They did a four hour set back to back. So I fit, so I, I decided to go out um went out quite no went out about half 11 went out about half 11 um because it was a cheat day kind of meal i decided to go to get some hot wings at a little local chicken wing shop which is uh around the grove in stratford and this particular one in Stratford as well i think I've, i might have mentioned it previously but it's strange because you know whenever you walk past a chicken shop and it's always got queues it's always busy and people are sitting especially people are sitting down inside it because i think sometimes chicken shops because they're so like gross it's so cheap. People don't want to be in there, right? They just want to, like, get their food and fucking he head the fuck out, right? And just eat and get home. But this is one of the rare chicken shops in my area that people actually sit in. And not, like, just hood guys. Like, regular folk. Like, families and shit. Groups of boys. Groups of guys going out. Groups of girls. Like, I see people in there having a meal and sitting down all the time. So, it seems like quite a cool little spot to go into. I was thinking, okay, cool. I'm going to go there, right? So, I decided to go in there. And, and lo and behold, it's fucking spotless. You know, there's rare chicken shops you go into where the guy actually takes care of the chicken shop. Like, it's spotless, no fucking dirt or grime on the floor. The oven is fucking sparkling. It's not, doesn't have that uh, three-day-old fried oil uh, kind of smell to it for the most part. Um, the chicken tasted really, really, like, succulent, well-made, nice chips, fairly well-priced. I think I might have got, like, six wings of chips, maybe 250 or something, or 260 or something along those lines. And it closed, I think, at, like, 12... No, I think half 12 or something like that, so quite late for, like, a chicken shop. So I decided to kind of get a meal there at half 11, um, sit down, listen to some tunes before I went to the set. Just kind of, you know, give myself a little pre-thing before. I like to... I think it's nice to kind of, you know, when you're going out, clubbing-wise, it's nice to have a little, like, ritual uh, in the evening. Like, so that means, like, I don't know, I went to, I went to the gym... Uh, so I, I went to I went to have a run so recently when I came in the morning or that Saturday I came back showered uh, did some push-ups ate quite clean in the day didn't drink any alcohol uh, watched up some TV series um, read a book relax just relax you know wind it down and then I didn't eat anything until I think no I didn't eat the last meal I had was maybe like at four and I said you know I'm gonna have another meal when I go at eleven just so I can have something to line the belly I don't have to come back home and eat like a burger at five a.m. in the night because I don't really like to do that sort of stuff I'd rather have a, uh, some dinner. Uh, later, I could have probably had it a bit more earlier at nine, but I think I would have been hanging when I got to the bar. So you do all that, and then you head out eleven o'clock, eleven thirty. You put a mix on your headphones, listen some good beats, some good tunes, right? Some good beats and tunes, 
and then you get to the chicken shop you order your nice meal you get a seat next to the window so you can people watch a little bit put your headphones in uh, admire the girls going by in their nice outfits admire the guys in their fucking horrible jeans right you just you just sit there and then and you know just, just chill have your chicken relax Take a take a breather, and then when you're finished and you're well and done, you kind of get your little um, lemon wet wipes out. You wipe your fingers off, you know, dust off your mouth, and you head out to the nightclub. Um, I decided to go there the long way. I could have easily got the train. I got the two seven six there, which was probably a bad idea because it took fucking ages to arrive. It took ages to get there, but we got there in the end. Um, the queue wasn't too long as well to get to to get into mix, which is quite cool um, for the most part. Two separate queues, non-ticket and ticket holders, fairly quick to go into. Security is there. It's always pretty safe. Um, um, of course, remember to bring your ID. Those kind of places, they usually always ask for ID, even if you do look older, which I definitely do with this beard. That's the kind of, uh, comf- uh, what you call it? Uh, the the kind of, um, what, what, what would you call it? The situation that I'm at at the moment where you kind of, you want to look younger, so you shave the beard off. But then you want to look cool, so you grow a beard. It's kind of a weird place to be in at the moment. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, I still need to braid my hair, which I haven't done because I'm lazy. Um, again, maybe, you know, I want a service. Or so. would I, would I, I'm not sure how comfortable I should be if I had, had a service or some sort of um, app that allowed, like in the same way, there's, there's an app, I think, for barbers, I think. I forgot what it is. Let me see. I, I remember I downloaded it the other day, actually. Is that for barbers? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, trim it. Yeah, it's called Trim it. Where it's like, it's like an Uber for barber shops, for barbers. Sorry, um, independent ones where you can kind of uh, see who's around you and they can come to your house and cut your hair. I don't know how comfortable I'll be to have like a girl braid my hair though. I'm not sure <laughs> how well that would go down with a brunette walking in after work and then you see your head in between some girl's lap while she's braiding your hair. I don't know about that one, man. But anyway, um, yeah, so went to Mix for Origins to see Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez play back-to-back, which was fucking sick. From they, I think they started at 12. The annoying thing about that night, I think I think everything else was perfect. And the one annoying thing I think criticism might have is that it seems as if most London nightclubs are very hesitant, or even club nights or promoters, very hesitant to release the, the, uh, the set times ahead of time. They don't want to do that. And I think the main reason they do that is because they are worried that people are only going to turn up for the DJ that they want to see, right? But the issue I have with that is that if you're if you're Origins and you hired or you've booked Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez because you know they want some of the you know two of the best DJs that we have um, on the scene at the moment, you want them to play at your club night because you know they're going to bring a crowd. So it doesn't make any sense for you to get them to come down and then not release the set times for people that want to see them specifically. And even for the people that don't want to see them specifically and just want to have a good night out, they're going to come anyway. Um, I don't think you're going to get any more new people there. Who, if I'm not, I don't think you're going to dissuade anyone by putting out a, tra- a set list, for instance. It doesn't make sense. I think, if anything, maybe the rain might affect people, the weather. I think you might have seen that happen on Friday with the, the night they had at, uh, at the cause. Um, the kind of the whole the thing the the two day event that happened the other day with Apollina and a few other people. Uh, I think the rain kind of fucked up a few a few people's evenings, so people didn't end up coming out. But for the most part, if you're gonna go to this club night, you're gonna go regardless. It would be nice to have like an idea on what the set times are. Luckily, I kind of guessed that they were gonna do a long extended set because I saw Dr. Rubenstein tweeted the other day or put on Instagram actually, which is insane. She uh she said she um she DJ I think in Bel in Berkheim for eleven hours which is absolutely insane. Imagine DJing somewhere for 11 fucking hours. So I kind of had an idea that they, were, they weren't going to play like a two-hour set. They're definitely going to play a bit longer, but I really wish Origins would have put that club, the night, uh, the time, the, um, the set list out or the, yeah, out a bit earlier. Um, a few people asked on the event wall, but their questions got ignored, which is quite annoying when you're, that's a, that's a kind of a, one of those things that I kind of give a lot of credit to, Gary Vaynerchuk about where he mentioned I think in quite a few earlier videos how he would always tell people like you have to have the reply you have to reply to um you have to reply to every comment that you get on your social media platform and I think that's something I've kind of done quite religiously um for the most part just re- and then reply because you know how much and how how it hurts or how annoying it can be when you ask a question at, on an event or you inquire about something and they completely ignore the thing that you, that you that you're asking about because it, 
because they don't want to tell you. You'd rather they just say, hey, we're not going to release the set times at the moment, but if you come early, we promise. I don't know, we'll just give you a hint about something. They don't even answer it. So someone asked it in the event war, they completely ignored the question, which is annoying. But, you know, I kind of guessed they were going to be there for um, four hours anyway. Um, just because I saw, like I said, I think I saw his post on her site. There, there we go. I saw his post on her uh, Facebook page. And it mentioned that she played, yeah. It said here, she mentioned she played an 11 hour set at the burger. So here, Dr. Ruben Science is on, on um, our Facebook page. After 11 after eleven hours in the DJ booth, I'm very happy and very done. Much love to all the dancers. You were a heart, heart, heart emoji. I literally almost cried at the end of my set. Wow, man. Absolutely amazing. Imagine playing for 11 hours. That must be so magical, man. Like, credit to her. I play a lot every night for four hours and a half, right? And I really, really enjoy it. I think it's probably one of the things I've kind of enjoyed for a, the longest time. Oh, yeah, here it is, isn't it? Like, 11 hours set. Yeah, the, the, the set list at Bergheim. So, yeah, so they always have that running order at Bergheim. They always release it ahead of time. They have, like, set lists for months and months and months in advance. So of course, it's the Bergheim. They probably have a little bit more room to maneuver. People are going to go there for the club anyway in general, I know. But I really would like a change in kind of... Um, I don't know clubbing etiquette when it comes to promoters just put out the set list ahead of time we're going to come regardless we bought our tickets like I had this in my mind for a long time since I saw her kind of uh, set on YouTube and I kind of was following a few of her interviews and I kind of liked the way she's talked about things I kind of was going to see them play regardless anyway so you're not going to dissuade me by putting out a set list and you're probably not going to get that many people coming anyway because they saw a set list. They're going to just come regardless if they want to come. So that was a bit of a bummer. But essentially when I got there, they started just about time. Um, I decided to kind of make my way towards the dance floor because that's where all the people go that are fucking serious about clubbing. You don't go and just fucking, you know, I don't know, hang around or stand at the edge or get a drink first. You go to the fucking dance floor and you check the temperature. Where the dance floor, check the temperature. Everyone dancing, everyone throwing their hands in the air like fucking great tunes from the, from the very beginning I, when I got there so I had to go upstairs put my, my bag in the, my sorry my coat in the cloakroom pretty simple to do I think the first couple of times I went there I don't think they had a cloakroom I'm pretty sure they didn't have a cloakroom the one time I went there before for Pussy Palace they didn't have one so I had to kind of attach my coat in the corner which wasn't advantageous though no, because you might get nicked so I put my bag um, upstairs Gave the cloakroom lady a little tip as on top of it, which is I always do. I think most people should do that, especially considering the job and how annoying people are when they get in the coats at the end. And so I had to go back downstairs and party and dance my ass off for the best part of four hours. Basically, I didn't leave the dance floor apart from going to the toilet a few couple a couple of times or from getting a drink. I was on the dance floor the whole entire time, dancing, sweat my ass off, like absolutely had a blast. Um, so much so, uh, I had so much of a blast that. Um, that yeah that you know just had a blast met some interesting people on the dance floor exchanges some you know some facebook details as per usual and it, and ended up at the end of the set when i had a good time got a picture with the djs themselves which i'm i'm gonna sh i should put on the screen but i don't know it's good not to do it but i'll show on my phone even though it's cracked there it is me with dr rubenstein and roy Perez playing back to back fucking amazing man i think that they're really close friends anyway you can tell from the set i think there's a big difference you can probably tell it i think if you've been out a few times with djs play you can tell when they're friendly with each other or they respect each other's work um how much better how better the back-to-back -back set goes when they're just you know um, for a foreign to each other and the promoter kind of books them to play back to back I think it's better when they have a, a connection or a relationship or they have a similar sound or something I don't know something complementing to each other but when they're friends you can really tell and um, yeah it was an amazing set man. probably one of the best things I've seen in a long time I kind of bemoan the idea that you have to kind of always book stuff in advance when you go to London and there's so many events on and um, some of the club nights don't go on for long enough but I think in terms of what we have available, it's not Bergheim. It's not going to be open until 6. It's not going to be open until 12. But for what's available, I think Mix, especially since it's only around the corner of my house, it's like a 10, 15 minute walk. Um, it's in a fairly cool location. The bar staff are really cool. The people that work there are really cool from the front, from the door girl to security, um, to everyone there. The sound is amazing. I think for what it's worth, it's probably one of the best venues out there. And I really, really encourage everyone to kind of check it out. I think this Friday, they've got Pussy Palace um, doing a party there, which is probably one the best nights out at the moment i think to be honest if you like if you like work it vibes but you like it a bit real a little bit more uh with an lgbtq tint towards it a little bit more drag involved a little bit more club kitty involved a little bit more sh uh, showmanship a little bit more 
of um of a of a just a celebration, right? I think you should go to Pussy Palace. It's fucking incredible. One of the best parties I've been to. I went to the original Pussy Palace was actually in that Pussy Palace house place that was cool, but now they've sort of leveled up and honestly like it's so it's probably the randest I've ever seen that place in my life. Like it's incredible. The last couple of times I went there was a couple of drag queens performing. Um they had like a runway stage that they put out there. It was fucking nuts. Like absolutely nuts. And mix and mix obviously is a good place to do it in because it's it's like a basic and industrial warehouse sort of like stock room kind of place so it kind of the contrast of having these amazing sort of like done up performers with their makeup on and their stilettos and their lycra on um against a backdrop of these kind of massive beer kegs and shit it's fucking gnarly and it's so cool so i recommend you check it out um uh, there's a couple people that i know that are playing on the lineup too so if you're into if you're into the, you know the general hip hop R and B sort of vibe, I recommend you check out Pussy Palace, one of the best nights they do out there. But yeah, um, big up Origins uh, for doing that night. Um, that was incredible. Uh, big up Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez as well. You guys smashed it. Um, incredible, incredible performance, and I can't wait to see them again live again. So I recommend you check both of them out, Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez. I'll 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 figure out for a link actually to a set that I like of both of theirs, and you can kind of check them out. But I recommend you check them for the longest. <laughs> Um, and then what else did I do? Um, oh, and then of course on Sunday, United played Liverpool, which is an absolute failure of a game. We ended up losing 3-1, as everyone expected it to be. But I think the, the disparity in quality, the disparity in effort and just overall team performance was so frightening to see for most United fans that it was a bit of a wake-up call for the board, which then led to yesterday's news that Reno got fired, which was... Um, incredible honestly um something that caught me kind of guard i wasn't expecting i wasn't expecting it i was um i think a lot of people kind of had the assumption that we were only going to fire Mourinho when it was mathematically impossible we we're going to finish on top four but i think uh the overall morale of the team and the idea that we were going to wait that late in the season until we were mathematically impossible because i think you know the top five top six is quite quite close as a uh, apart from the top two teams i think you know everyone else is quite close so it would have gone down to the wire it would have gone quite late in the in the in the season for us to be mathematically impossible which then would have kind of it's essentially written off the season but i think now with you know with the second half of the season coming up we've got five we've got five or so games coming up with which we on paper sh could win if we we're on form I think it's worth a punt to maybe get rid of Mourinho, uh, get that new manager a bump, and then kind of hopefully hope that the atmosphere around the team is going to improve us. Because I think Liverpool showed, that game in Liverpool showed that even though Liverpool are a better team than us, I think if you look at that starting eleven, even just look at the bench even. I think we had even a stronger bench in terms of player ability, right, quote-unquote. I think if you look at our team sheet compared to Liverpool's, I think it's quite comparable. They, they're not like, they're not, it's not like a Man City. They're not like leaps and bounds ahead of us in terms of squad quality and depth. I think for the most part, Liverpool and United are probably on the same level, but Klopp has been able to get so much out of the players he has available. He's been able to sprinkle them in with some quality too, in terms of Fabinho, in terms of Virgil van Dijk, in terms of Cater. He's been able to add some quality, but for the most part, this, the spine of that, of that club, the main structure of that club is fairly decent, right? It's not that way ahead of, of United so I think that kind of contrast really made the board decide you know what time to get rid of Mourinho and in general anyway I think he just did such a poor job I think especially recently that it was he's got real he's got really no excuses I think for the most part we haven't we didn't we never saw the Mourinho side uh, the, the signature Mourinho side we never really saw it at United right he was always known for being pragmatic and being um and kind of always uh, valuing defense over attack for the most part, and but for them, but we didn't really see him build a defense, a title winning defense that could contour, that could kind of uh, you could attribute to his Jose Mourinho. The defense was always the shakiest part of our team. Um, he didn't necessarily get the goals or the attack wise down, apart from maybe the start of the last season. And it kind of all kind of deteriorated when then he started picking fights with the boardroom, started picking fights with the players. And it just never got better after that. And um, some could argue that, you know, his experience at Real Madrid has always kind of burned him for the most part. And it was kind of the first real time he failed at like a big marquee club. And players kind of questioned his... Um, um, his, his methods of getting things out of players, right? Because I think uh, quite famously, a lot of the Real Madrid fans weren't really happy with how he tried to uh, instill the siege mentality in Real Madrid, tried to make uh, the players believe that they were playing for a small club and everyone, everyone was against them when it was kind of, you know, when that wasn't the truth at all. Most of the Liga fans that watch La Liga will know that, you know, Real Madrid get a lot of favorable decisions from officials. They have, the, they have an array of talent that is like, 
you know, uncomparable to some other clubs. So the idea that he was going to go in there and pretend like, you know, he was managing Nottingham Forest and try and get an us against them attitude. The players weren't really feeling it. Plus the players he was managing had won World Cups, they'd won European Cups, they'd won Champions League before he got there. So they weren't necessarily that enamored with his personality, his cult of personality, right? Uh, they already won things. So they needed a kind of probably a different kind of manager at that time. He picked too many fights. Iker Casillas, Sergio, Sergio Ramos, Cristiano Ronaldo, all were fight, public fights that he had. And in general, he lost his job and that kind of maybe burned and wrangled him. And then by the time we got him at United, I think we probably got him a season or two too late. I think he probably should have been a manager we got after Sides Ferguson. I think that would have worked better because he had he, he would have had a team of experienced players before. Because I don't think Mourinho, I think as it's been proved, I think he's probably aware of this too. He just doesn't have the patience or the ability to rebuild a club. He's not, he's not a Pochettino he's not going to do that what he can do really well is he can come in with a three-year window and sign a bunch of 28 uh, year olds and plus and kind of get you titles and win you trophies he can definitely do that for sure especially if you've got a club that's already got the structure in place you've got a director of football you've got a football director you've got scouting networks you've got that things in place that he can, can just come in and manage the personalities inside the dressing room and tactically get them in shape and kind of you know and get some big marquee players in there that can kind of make the difference and you're done that's essentially what his Inter Milan side was with Etu and all those guys right he had a solid defense that you could you know pepper would pepper would shot all day long and you would never score and then he had lethal uh forwards up front that will punish you on the first instance so uh um, without that he's not really going to be a success and i think united was just too much of a job to do he had to get rid of dead wood that were on because we were probably we, we've got that one of the highest wage bills i think in europe right but for the most part it's not because we've got like amazing players it's because we always give players contract extensions we never let players we never let players go we always try and retain players on long or we always kind of trigger contract extensions or renewals. So he had to get rid of Deadwood. He had to get rid of players who are signed for a lot of money and a lot of other players, other clubs wouldn't want to necessarily pay. He had to try and get new players in. It was just a harder job to do than it actually seemed like it. And I think he had to fix too much in the short period of time that he was going to be there. And then he had to pick, he had battles that he would have picked. He had the board, boardroom struggles. It just wasn't going to work out. So that was kind of, that's kind of over and happy that's kind of done. Um, he's obviously laughing to the bank because supposedly the story goes, he's got anywhere between 10 million to two, 22 million payout um, ahead of time, which is fucking nuts. I think football is the only industry in the world, right, where you can fail at something and you can still become a multimillionaire, right? Like, Imagine the amount of money David Moyes must have got for failing at his job within the first eight months of his contract. Like, it's insane, isn't it, football? Like, you can fail at something and you can still become a multi-millionaire. Like, no other job does that to you. Maybe except for the banking industry, uh, maybe it might do that, right? Where you kind of get rewarded the more sleazy you are in that regard or the more back, or the more, or the more you, the more you go through back channels, the more kind of you get rewarded, like high risk, high reward sort of thing. Um... But also the the bonuses are quite outlandish, aren't they? Like you have people get like three hundred million dollar at what you get bonuses at the end of the year and stuff, and you're wondering like what did you, did you actually do? Like you know what I mean? Anyway, um, so yeah, that chapter's over, and now it's been confirmed that uh, so Oligan Social is taking over on a temporary basis. It's a bit weird how he's taking over. I think maybe we're taking some examples from the Spanish clubs. Um, what Real Madrid done recently? So what's happening is now is that we've got an interim manager. No, we've got caretaker managers. No, we've got interim. Wait, we've got so. Mourinho got fired, and now Carrick and McKenna are taking over with, for the club for the next two days, right? Doing uh, taking over training, and then uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is going to take over. His first game is going to be, I think, on Saturday or Sunday against Cardiff, the, the club he actually got famously fired from because they got they got they went down to uh, they got relegated when they came up a couple of a few seasons ago. And then after he's and then he's going to be here for six months, and then in May we're going to hire a new manager. A kind of permanent fixture manager who everyone's kind of thinking is going to be Pochettino or Zidane or something along those kind of lines. So it's a bit strange. It's like you're going through three essential managers in a way. But I guess the reason why that's happening is because for the most part, Carrick and McKenna are going to be part of United's coaching staff overall. They're going to be in. They're going to be still at the club in various guises, whether they're going to be uh, managing the reserves on the under 19s or something along those kind of lines. So I would guess that's why they want to keep them on board because usually when managers get fired, the whole kind of coaching staff gets chucked out the door too. But it seems as if they want to keep those two guys on board, and I'm assuming they've got quite a good relationship with the players. And then Social's going to come in for to give the kind of club a bit of a good feeling bump a little bit, uh, kind of you know get people on board, uh, maybe 
maybe inspire some confidence in some players who haven't been performing. And then the hope is a new manager then can build on that kind of uh, upsurge and then kind of progress and take things forward a little bit. Um, I guess Solskjaer, for the most part, has to kind of deal with the Pogba issue because, of course, you know, the issue came out with Pogba where um, when Mourinho got announced he was fired and that kind of Instagram tweet went out where he was saying, caption this. Whereas, you know, I think that the... Um, a person with like a person that's worked in social media, who's worked in kind of online marketing, will know. Uh, looking at the hashtags, looking at the time that post went out, that that was a timed or scheduled post that was done on behalf of the brand. It wasn't something that Pogba had control over, and that's just something that we were aware of because we saw pictures of Pogba and Dybala doing a photo shoot in Paris for Adidas a couple of a day ago or so, where they were wearing the same tracksuit and shit. So we know that they were already doing some sort of promo for Adidas. So it wasn't a surprise when that picture came out. Obviously, the timing was a bit unfortunate, but these things happen, right? Someone forgot that that scheduled post was still on there and it went out. Uh, scheduled post, for the most part, you don't get reminded that scheduled post is going to go out. It just goes out and you have to kind of go back on it all the time. And of course, people read more into it because Pogba's got a strange relationship with Mourinho. But I don't really see the problem with it, to be honest. I think if you're Pogba and you do feel as if like Mourinho's being a dick to you, right? You feel as if Mourinho's kind of made an issue out of you out of nothing. Because if you look at it really and you analyze the issue that's happened for, for the most part, Pogba, yes, his performances have been a bit shit on the pitch, but he's not done anything off the pitch that would um, encourage or that would tell you that he's not taking football seriously or that he's kind of uh, taking the piss out of the manager. He hasn't really come out publicly and said anything. He's, I think the, uh, the only comments I've heard him say was that, you know, if I say anything, the manager would kill me or I'm not allowed to say something to the press. So he, for the most part, he was quite quiet. He, I think he mentioned that thing about we need to attack more, right? Um, which I think Mourinho didn't take too well to, but he hasn't necessarily been saying anything that Mourinho would say to him. Mourinho has been the one kind of really going at him from the moment that World Cup ended. He kind of insinuated that the only reason why Pogba played well was because he was around. Uh, he was in a camp that only concentrated on football. He kind of made an assumption that when he's only concentrated on football, he plays better. Which means that you know when he's distracted, aka when he's in Manchester, um, that's when he plays the worst. So he was kept throwing darts, throwing bullets at him, um, constantly, constantly kind of poking at him, and you know he's responded. I don't think that's anything bad around it. It might be in bad taste. It might be whatever it may be. If I believe that's true, I don't believe it is true. I think in general it was a mistake. It was a scheduled tweet. But even if he did it on purpose, I don't really see the issue of it. I think you should be allowed to give your managers back some sticks, especially if they're out of a job. Like he's gone now. He can't. There's nothing he can do anyway. But I think um, Solskjaer is going to be have to really get that. Un- in, uh, under grips because Pogba is a player we should build a team around but he should be also know that you know there are limits to uh, how much we should be accommodating of him if he isn't able to kind of knuckle down and work hard and really show what he's because he's there's a player there we saw it against we saw it with France in the World Cup but frustratingly he didn't put any colour in his hair he didn't have any funny designs and which was on purpose I think as well generally what he did there or maybe he just didn't have a bit to bring a barbell with him to Paris I mean to Russia maybe the manager got a bit tight with that shit I don't know um, but we saw that he he made a constrained effort to keep his game very simple and we saw the rewards of it. We saw how influential he was in that game. I know some people are saying he wasn't that great in the World Cup. Craig Bellamy for sure said that a couple of times in Sky Sports videos I've watched but I think he did really well. He played amazingly well. Very, very disciplined for someone that everyone keeps saying is ill-disciplined and doesn't keep his position well. He played incredibly, incredibly well. Of course, he was con- complimented by a whole bevy of fucking uh, incredible midfield talent around him but he played incredibly well and there's a real player in there so we want to see that United to hopefully Ole Gunnar Solskjaer can kind of get him on board and kind of settle that down. It'll be interesting to see what he's going to do with Lukaku and Martial and Rashford up front and Sanchez will be back fit. What kind of formation will uh, Solskjaer prefer? Will he want a 4 4 3? Will he want a, a target man in, in up front? Will he go unconventional and play a false nine? I'm interested to see what he's going to do there. I'm interested to go and do in midfield. Will he continue playing for Matic and Fellaini? Uh, even though they've both been quite poor. Fellaini because he's just not good at football. But he's been trying his heart out, don't get me wrong. But he's just not good enough for United in that level. Uh, Matic because he's kind of over the hill and has been for the most part. But he's only been playing because he's Mourinho's favourite. So interesting to see what he's going to do there. What he's going to do with the defence. Like Loads of interesting questions are going to come in there. Which are going to set the kind of groundwork for the next uh, manager to start again in May there is a possibility he probably might get the job anyway if he does a good enough job right if he imagine he does the impossible and wins the Champions League and gets us top four at the same time right you probably might keep the job right there's a possibility of that he might be keep the job in general or he might just ride into the sunset because I think that's what Di Matteo did right he, he came in as an interim manager won the Champions League and then quite quickly after that this new season started he kind of was a bit of a failure and then kind of got fired straight away so it might be quite a good idea just to kind of come in if you do with the Champions League just leave anyway do you know what I mean? And then you kind of set the impossible target for the next manager coming in. So like what Zidane did, right? When he won, uh, uh, is it two consecutive uh, Europa Leagues? I mean, Champions Leagues with Real Madrid. And then he just left after 
he didn't. He, do you know what I mean? Like, nah, fuck, fuck. There's nothing more I can do after this, uh, for the most part. Um, so yeah, let's see what happens next. Um, Solskjaer has joined. I think I've got. Was let's see the statement here. I'll read out the statement quickly. What he says. Um, it kind of leaked as well accidentally on fucking social as well. I mean, is a bit of a shit show in it. How we do stuff. We're not really. The panaches are really there, quiet at the moment. Um, do remember when the story got leaked ahead of the Newcastle game that Mourinho was going to get fired regardless of the result? And then we pulled through a performance and he didn't get fired. And then now with this, the Norwegian Prime Minister kind of uh, announced that Oshas was going to go. There was a kind of some metadata in the script of United that kind of showed a video that Oshas joined. Like, it was a bit shit of a shit show, but in general, we kind of got it sorted now. I'll kind of get the statement up on screen here. You guys can see it. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer appointing caretaker manager. Manchester United announced today that former uh, striker Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has been appointed caretaker manager until the end of 2018 season. Solskjaer scored 126 goals in 360 appearances from 96 to 2007. In 2008, he became the club reserve manager before taking manager of Royal Mold. Uh, in Mold in Norway, Solskjaer will take charge of his first team with media effect and will remain in the place while the club conducts a thorough recruitment process for a new full-time manager. He will be joined by Mike Phelan, amazing, and, and working alongside Mike Carrick and McKenna. Okay, so that lends itself to what I was saying before. They want to keep um, McKenna and Carrick uh, in, within the club or whatever. So, um, so I was comment here. Manchester is in my heart and it's brilliant to be coming back in this role. I'm really looking forward to working with every very talented squad we have, the staff and everyone at this club. Already, already, the first statement, right? He's already looking forward to working with the very talented squad that we have. He came in already bigging up the players that he has instead of Mourinho. Remember that famous press conference um, in, um, where was it? I think in pre-season of the the US pre-season tour, right? He mentioned something along the lines of like, ah, oh, um, 90% of the players that I have here aren't the players that are going to be starting the season. So it's a bit pointless, this kind of preseason tour. Really, really negative comments that I made. I remember mentioning, let me try and get up and see if I can remember what it said. But comments like thinking like, imagine if you're a youth team player and you're, and you're hearing that for the first time. Like, you're like, what the fuck, man? This guy's a, this guy's an absolute dick. You know what I mean? Um, let me see it here. Jose Mourinho. Press conference preseason. Yeah, there you go. Here it is. Yeah. So let me try and get this up here on the screen so you guys can see. Does that kind of highlight what you've been saying about your squad, the need for further reinforcements? And if so, what progress is being made? This is during the preseason tour of the US. This are the reinforcements. Uh, this is not our our team, this is not our squad. We start the game with uh, Almost half of the players are not even going to belong to our spot on the 9th of August. Many of them are not going to be here. So this is not this is not our spot. Reinforcement. You are saying you are saying players that I would like to buy, I would like to add to the squad. That's another thing. But this is not my squad. This is not even half of my squad. This is not even 30% of my squad. So don't look to to this that way. You can ask me if with all your players you still want some new players. That's another that's another question. But um, in relation to today, you have we have four or five players that are dead because they care with the club. They care with the team. They try to give everything, even risking themselves, because they don't want to let all the kids by themselves on the pitch against Milan, against Liverpool, against Real Madrid. They don't want to do that. Uh, as an example, Eric Bailly was not going to play, and when we saw that Smalling in the warm-up was leaving, he decided by himself, I don't want another kid on the pitch. It's not fair for uh, Alexis and Mata and Herrera and the guys that are there. So we are just trying to, to play these matches the best we can. Which I For me, that was the end. That was what really kind of like spiked the end of me. I was like, you know, I've had enough of Mourinho. The dour nature of his, usually preseason tours are jubilant affairs because you get the chance to kind of like 
bring some of the kids on tour with you. You get a chance to maybe um, showcase some new signings. They get to play in a kind of bit of a slow down pace and you got to go to the States. Everyone gets a tan, blah, blah, blah. It's quite cool, right? It's quite a fun time for the most part. It seems like a fun time. But he was so dour in terms of the whole preseason tour because obviously it was at the back of a World Cup. So a lot of the players that he was talking about, especially some of the senior guys, they hadn't come back yet. They had an extra week off. And he was kind of giving the impression as if he expected... Like, it kind of seemed like he was giving the impression that he expected these World Cup players to come back straight away to kind of help out the team. No, I'm playing the fucking World Cup, man. Let me have a break. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, the Premier League season is already relentless as it is anyway. You don't get any sort of breaks. You play all the way through Christmas, all the way through Boxing Days, all the way through the new year. If you're going to get a break, it's going to be that kind of week break just after the World Cup is finished, especially if you if your team has kind of progressed all the way into the, uh, the knockout stages. It's quite beneficial to do that. And he kind of gave the assumption that he kind of wanted him to come back. He also gave the assumption that the players, that the U team players there, regardless of how hard they were trying and maybe how far behind in quality they were, they had absolutely no chance of playing within a first team when the season started because he had senior players who was going to rely on regardless of, how, who, regardless of their level of performance. It was fucking bizarre because that's not what United are about. United are not about that. United are about a team where if the senior, before, if the senior players aren't performing and aren't doing well, we just go back in a Rolodex. We look at the sub bench. If we haven't got anyone on the sub that's doing well, either we go to reserves, we can go to some reserves, we go to youth team. That's how we progress these players through. That's how a Rashford makes it in United because, um, well, living really, Lou Van Gaal needs to get a lot of credit for it. He didn't go out and sign another striker. And he also um, had spaces on the bench specifically for youth team players to sit on the bench, the best of the bunch. So that if a striker did go off injured, uh, your next available option maybe might have been a Rooney, but your option after that would have been a Rashford. So that kind of ability to do that is what's the DNA of United. The DNA of United isn't play old guys, it's senior players in their roles, regardless of how shit they're performing week in, week out, and then hope something changes. The role is, no, let's bring through some youngsters and play them, even if they're not, uh, quote-unquote, the type of player that I need. Mourinho just didn't involve his thing. He was a, he didn't want to, he didn't want to, evolved for us he didn't want to uh be malleable to us and we've been doing we didn't want to be malleable to him uh, the board kind of fucked him over too didn't give him the signings he wanted and he, did, he wasn't really willing to kind of work with what he was available he was he was just like hell-bent on getting players in more players signed i think he mentioned before with uh, man city that you know they had some white they had some wing backs something like that before. i think he mentioned something about man city's defensive signings they signed some wing backs who they didn't like or full backs and then they went out the market and signed some more again he kind of made the assumption that United, even though he's he signed players, they weren't good enough. So he needed he needed more money to sign some more again. And then the, obviously the board wasn't willing to do that because you know we've got a high enough wage bill as it is because we don't get we don't get let go of bloody players. And then having a manager in who's quite transitional, who isn't going to stay for more than three seasons, it doesn't make any sense to kind of give him more money to sign more misfit players who are then the man the other manager coming in has to kind of like you know uh, fix and put it together in a hodgepodge team. Anyway, that stuff's over now. Uh, Solskjaer is now our manager. I'm really happy about that. I can't wait to see what happens at six months. Might be a bit of a write-off. I think we're not gonna probably not gonna get top four now. Probably a bit too far behind for top four. It's like eleven points got to make up, and that's eleven points just to make up on our end. That isn't um, counting into the fact that you know Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, and the Arsenal, Chelsea, or whatever Tottenham aren't gonna go on extended runs as well. We have to hope they drop points and we win all our game which is very unlikely because we haven't really shown that we can string together um uh, a run of winning games for instance but if we if we can kind of get a bit of a bounce in there in the squad overall get a bit of commitment involved in the players because i think in general on paper we've got the players there we just need to you know have a better outlook a better kind of way of playing a more attacking way because I think, you know, for the most part, with a team like ours that isn't probably as strong as it can be, needs to be defensively, I think we just need to concentrate on making sure our attacking players have the freedom in order to kind of punish teams when we get the opportunity. If we can't really rely on Jones, Smalling, Bay, Lindelof to kind of keep the goals out, we need to make sure we have players on the other end who can score the goals when the opportunity comes to them. And that requires having a style of play that we can recognise. At the moment, what would style of play we say United play at? I have no idea. Do you know what I mean? We don't, I don't know what we do, what we do. If it's attacking, I don't know if we're putting crosses. I don't know if we hoof the ball up. I don't know if we play small uh, balls around the corner. I don't know if we're playing one-two touch. I don't know what we do. We need to have our style of play and hopefully that'll bring the best out of people like Lukaku, who's kind of had a bit of a bad run of it, but I don't think he'd become a bad player overnight or in one season. He's got 27 goals last season. Now he's only got about seven or some shit. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of been a, a real, real steep decline. He looks completely shot of confidence, supposedly put on too much muscle, which I don't really believe. Um, and his touches suddenly d deserted him. He's never been he's never been Iniesta, do you know what I mean? But he's never been this bad in terms of his first touch. So we need to kind of get him back on song. Alex Sanchez, when he's back fit as well, 
it may be a good idea to kind of get him back on song too. He's been probably one of the best players in the Premier League for the past three seasons when he was at Arsenal and all of a sudden he came to United and he turned into dog shit. I don't believe that's true either. I think there's a player in him too we can get out of it. A lot of scope that he needs to kind of realise and hope, hopefully uh, Solskjaer can kind of get the best out of the players right now and we can kind of move on and move on up. But yeah, so that's been... Uh, yeah, I think I made, I've actually made a video actually about the United stuff on my YouTube channel which um, you can check out if you want to. I think it's called... Um, it doesn't mean you're sacked on the long lines when, when, the, when the announcement kind of got made. But I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what happens next in the next run-up of games. What else is on here? Moving on, moving on deep. Oh, have you seen this? So Tottenham have opened up and Tottenham New Stadium has just opened, right? And they've got this amazing uh, pint pouring machine. Have you seen this? It looks fucking cool. I'm surprised I haven't seen this more often in more bars and clubs. I'm assuming because it's probably quite expensive system to kind of fit. I'm assuming more so than the standard sort of like tap system. You know, when you're going to get a pint in a bar, they have like a keg and a tap that you kind of leave it on. You kind of hold the glass up to an angle so the bubbles don't firm up and then you kind of have a perfect pint. But there's a new system that I saw um, debuted um, in Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which I saw uh, originally linked on Twitter, but then I saw a video about the actual service. So I'll show you the original video I saw on Twitter. I thought this was quite cool. It's not cool in the sense that it's still plastic cuts being used, but I think just in general, in terms of the the the, the bit to do it, it's it's quite amazing, I reckon. So this is the video I've got on YouTube. I've got on Twitter. Sorry, if you listen to something, essentially what it is is a glass. Is like there's essentially like a little grill sort of thing on the on the bar table, and it's a kind of uh, a little tap. I'm, I'm assuming like a little spray thing. You put the glass on top of, and you press it down, and the beer kind of fills up from the bottom up. Instead of the other way around, which is amazingly cool. When you get a perfect pint all the time, it automatically stops itself. It's amazing, isn't it? Really, really cool. So, so, so cool. And then I saw the actual video from the company that do it. It's obviously called Bottoms Up. Uh, is a company that that do the actual service. And and yeah, I'm surprised more more, more bars do it, especially the busier bars. Like um, if you've ever been to like a uh is it kick i think kick bar or junior bar is it kick bar i think it's called kick in shoreditch there's a bar in shoreditch which has got like these little yellow benches uh just a couple of roads uh down from dragon bar i think yeah 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 it's called i think Juno you know one, one of those bars anyway, that does uh, plays a lot of football and they're really really busy so imagine a busy like football kind of bar in or sports bar in shoreditch that has a screen inside it or something or a couple of screens they're usually mostly the busy ones, especially on the weekend when kind of guys go out to watch football, whatever it may be. It would be quite beneficial to have those kind of services because usually people are ordering loads of pints for friends and shit as a big group of friends. So it might be good to kind of get two pints on at the same time and kind of get the person to kind of quickly take their pints off the table instead of waiting for someone to kind of fill up a glass. Um, you could probably do it with glass um, with glass cups too. It probably would need just to be a plastic cup as well. Um, and yeah, I've, I'm surprised more bars don't do it. Honestly, it looks fucking incredible. I'm going to get a video up from the actual company so you can check it out here. How does the bottoms up system work? Look up. A bottoms up cup has a hole in the bottom with a metal ring around it. It is sealed with a magnet. These magnets are FDA approved and can be printed with any advertisement in order to generate revenue, provide a coupon, and even souvenirs for your customers. When placed on a bottoms up dispenser, the nozzle post securely lifts the magnet away from the cup. The dispenser Ooh. automatically fills the cup wow. with a pre-programmed amount, leaving the service... Oh, you can get glass too. That's amazing. Items, ...getting food orders or completing transactions. Once the cup is full, it can stay on the dispenser until the server is ready to remove wow. it. Wow. This automated pour is highly effective in reducing wasted beer by eliminating operator error and excessive foam. Yeah. The system works with any one of our five sizes of disposable cups, glass pints, plastic pints, 32, and 64. That's so cool. In short, Bottoms Up drastically increases revenue from beer sales and creates happier customers with faster service and souvenir magnets. That is super, super cool, man. Um, again, like I think if you added, imagine adding a little bit on top of that and doing the and having the glasses chilled. You put them in the freezer; they have a bit chilled. They look because obviously, bar, clubs and bars in London don't do it, which is another thing. I wonder why bars and clubs and bar, pubs and bars in London don't have chilled glasses why is it because they just can't be bothered because they don't have a big enough fridge like why don't they do it they never ever do it it's just like you have to have to go to has to be a special bar does it usually dive bars do it a lot it's usually a, a kind of a little dive bar thing where everyone kind of wants to sit at the bar have like a nice chilled beverage and it's a bit quiet and there's not that many people in there 
they do that quite often. I remember the ones I've been to in the States, for instance, they all have chilled glasses. But UK, you don't get any chilled glasses, man. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. I don't know why that happens. It's really, really annoying. But that would be a great way to do it. So you put the things in there. You have a little marketing, um, a uh, little advertising on the little circle thing that goes on top of the magnet. Have chilled glasses. That would be fucking cool. But in stadiums, again, in general, I think that's a crazy, uh, innovative idea. Especially to like people that are... You, you're going to get such high turnover at the bar. Because people are essentially just ordering drinks, bang, 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 and then you can then then you can kind of concentrate the but the bartenders can concentrate on doing the more quote unquote complicated things like doing a cocktail or mixings or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, what a cool idea! I saw it earlier on, on the internet. I thought I'd share with you, lovely people. Um, yeah, I think you know what that's an hour, right? Isn't it here? So I think that might be a good place to you know pause for the moment. And then kind of come back again on the other side tomorrow with a longer episode. Um, but I guess, yeah. So this has been the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number one. Free, free. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been an absolute pleasure to have the company of uh, you, dear listeners. I'll be back again tomorrow with another jam-packed episode. I've got a lot more things to run through that I want to save for the other episode tomorrow. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. As always, um, all, uh, you can find all my details regarding myself on my website, excellentzinger.com. That's excellentzinger.com. Um, you can find links to my YouTube channel there. Uh, you're probably watching us on YouTube now, listening to the podcast. You can find substitute DJ mixes, DJ listings, blog entries, all that malarkey is going to be on there. And then I think possibly next week I'm going to do a little roundup post of some of my favorite albums I've listened to this week, this what well, this year, uh, favorite books I've read, favorite TV series, um, not favorite movies. So I don't really watch that many movies, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, I'm gonna do a roundup on some of my favorite things uh, on my special episode next week. So have a keep an eye out for that one. That'd be quite cool. Get the champagne out, have a little bit of a celebration. Uh, thanks to everyone that's been downloading and all that stuff. My lucky, it's been quite. A quite a good week for me a past couple of weeks probably the highest amount of downloads i've had in a long long time so that's been quite nice it might be due to me being more consistent um than i was in the beginning of the year but it's been a quite um what you call it nice to have that good reception from people out there strangers and people that i know alike. like so that's been very nice i'm very much appreciated and i'll continue to be delivering this kind of content in the new year too but before that i'll be back again tomorrow we're not going to wrap things up again so i getting teary-eyed about the, the year already so anyway thanks so much for tuning into the single show episode number one three three i'm gonna outro you with some music if you're listening via the audio if you're watching via the podcast if you're watching via um youtube actually like and subscribe share with your friends let them know that i'm here for you see you again very soon peace out